Okay, uh, my dear students, uh, I want you to know this terminology that we're going to be using for chapter two. In any class, you're gonna need a certain terminology. If you don't know the terms, if you don't know the words, it's gonna be very hard for you to understand a particular subject. Same thing in a theology or a religion class. You need to know a certain terminology. You also need to know this terminology when you read a chapter. If you do not know the terminology, then you don't know what you're reading. So I'm gonna begin by talking about these concepts that you should know for chapter two. Now, the first one is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you know that historically speaking, or at least scripturally speaking, in the Hebrew scriptures, we find the Ark of the Covenant. And we find that they were people who were saved from the flood, and those were the people who were to go into the ark. And then the flood came around, it flooded everything, uh, and whoever was not in the ark would die. Well, the church is seen as the ark of the covenant today. The ark of the covenant prefigures, foreshadows what the church would become a sacrament or a sign of salvation, okay? Now, the Assyrians are an interesting people because they are an ancient people who built an empire and when the Hebrew people broke their, their they broke the Ten Commandments, they broke their covenant with God, they suffered. How did they suffer? The Assyrians took over them and they suffered tremendously. And then they understood that they had to come back to God. And that's the Assyrian people. The land of Canaan is very important because it is the land that we call the land of milk and honey. It is the land of the Israelites today. It is the promised land. You know that there's a whole conflict there because that is also called Palestine. And the people who live there for centuries are the Palestinians and they claim that this is our land and it doesn't belong to anybody else. Well, the Hebrew people, or what we call the Jews today, went back to that part of the world and they claim it for their own and they say this is our land because in the Hebrew scriptures that was the land promised to them. Uh, it is the promised land and they used to call it a land of milk and honey and that's the land of king now when we say the word Christ we mean the anointed one this is the one chosen by God to save us on the cross and so the word Christ really literally means the anointed one okay we call Christ for Jesus, we call him the Savior, we call him the Messiah. He has many titles, but when we say Christ, we're talking about the anointed one or the chosen one of God to save the people, all of humanity, from the slavery of sin. Then we have circumcision. Now, even today, the Jewish people, when they deal with circumcision, they deal with circumcision as a ritual. A rabbi carries on a circumcision. It is not, I repeat, it is not a medical procedure. It is a ritual. Why? Because what the rabbi is trying to convey is that the circumcision is a sign of the covenant between the Hebrew people and God. So that's why circumcision is so important. Because it is a sign of the covenant or the agreement between God and His people. Then we have the word communion. And to be in communion is very important, even today in the Catholic Church, or in any church, you, if you are in communion, it means that you believe and that you share the values of that particular community. That means you are in community with those people. You believe the same thing that those people believed in. And so the Jewish people were in communion, and today we are supposed to be in communion in this body of Christ that we call the church or the Christian community. Then you have the word covenant. 
Remember that the word covenant in the Old Testament is not just a plain agreement. Remember what I said in the classroom. I said in the classroom that I bought a house and, and made an agreement. And the agreement that I made with the bank is that, okay, I will pay a certain amount of money and then I will make payments. And as long as I make the payments, then I will have the house until I pay it off completely. So the bank and I made an agreement. We made a covenant. However, we don't call that a sacred covenant because it is not a covenant that is between God and the bank or is between Mr. Padilla and God. No, it is a covenant. Um, the covenant is very, very simple. It's that agreement between God and his people. And I will simply say it in plain words. God speaks to his people and says, you will be my people and I will be your God. You keep the commandments, you fulfill the commandments, and you will fulfill your life on this earth and in the next. You do not fulfill the commandments which you're free not to do, and I will withdraw my favor from you. And when God withdraws his favor from the Hebrew people, we find in the pages of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures that now other peoples will slave them, like the Assyrian people, like the Babylonian people, by, like the Egyptian people. They will take over and they will enslave the Hebrew people. And then the Hebrew people cried out for God to help them and they decide that they are going to fulfill the Ten Commandments. They are going to fulfill the commandments of God. And then God will come and be on their side. And so that's, that covenant is very, very important. Christ in the New Testament becomes the new covenant. And I will explain that later as we go deeper into the understanding of what the church is. Then we have creation. And creation simply means that God created the universe out of nothing. And when I say the universe, I do not mean planet Earth. I mean all the planets, all the galaxies, the entire universe, He created out of nothing. And we, in the Christian community, as well as in the Muslim community, as well as in the Jewish community, we believe that God has no beginning and no end and that he is outside of time, that God created everything that is. And that's what we mean by creation. Now, the devil is called, sometimes in uh, the scriptures, he is called Baal. And he's also called the devil. He's also called Satan. He's also called the father of lies in the scriptures. And that is because his job is to tempt us away from God. And therefore, in order for us to not be tempted away, we must be aware of his presence in the world. And so we have this internal struggle or this spiritual struggle against the forces of evil that are commanded by Satan. Okay? And that he is also called a fallen angel because he fell from grace precisely because of pride. And that is to be found in the book of Revelation, or what we Catholics call the Apocalypse, or the last book of the 72 books of the Scriptures. Uh, then we go to De Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy, uh, you're going to find that Deuteronomy is, is, is kind of a boring book. It is very hard to read. And the reason is very simple. Deuteronomy uh, deals with all these laws and all of these are rules and regulations that the Hebrew people must keep. So it's a very, very difficult book to read. But it's one, it's the fifth book, I believe, of the, new, of the Old Testament. So we, we refer to it as the Pentateuch, Penta meaning five, and Pentateuch, uh, there are five books, the first five books of the scriptures, and Deuteronomy happens to be the fifth one. Now, the book of Exodus kind of speaks by itself because in the book of Exodus we find the story of Moses and how Moses is the liberator because he liberates the people, his people, the Hebrew people from the Egyptian slavery. Well, the same thing, he, 
Moses becomes a type of Christ. He prefigures Christ. Why? He foreshadows Christ because just as Moses was a liberator, Christ becomes a liberator. And what does Christ save us from? Is, is, does he save us from Egyptian slavery? No. He saves us from sin. And he does so by hanging on the cross. Then we have faith. The whole understanding of faith. Faith is not the enemy of reason. And unfortunately, a lot of people would like to paint believers as being people who do not use reason. But faith is not the enemy of reason. Because we have powerful arguments, not proofs, but arguments for the existence of God. And we can also give reasons for what we believe. In the area of theology, we call that apologetics. And so we have faith. And faith is also trusting. So let's say that you see a child crossing Ventura Boulevard, and he's a four or five year old, and you hold his hand as he crosses Ventura Boulevard, and the child is confident that nothing will come to him, no harm will come to him. Why? Because he trusts that this older person is going to be able to cross the street safely with him. That's also faith, okay? Also faith implies that we struggle with certain issues, that we struggle, and in the process of struggling, in that process we become stronger in our faith. So when we question our faith, we're not saying we are rejecting God, we are, we are saying is we are using our reason to understand better what is it that God wants to say to us. And that's the whole idea of faith. Then we have the fall. The fall is the idea that Adam and Eve fell from grace. Why? Because they disobeyed God. I know that many people think immediately the apple. The apple does not exist. Actually the scriptures speak of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It doesn't talk about an apple tree. So you may say, well, Mr. Badia, but they talked about the fall when we were little and they told us about an apple. Well, that's because you were little then and you could only understand that concept. You couldn't understand an ethereal, a distant concept like the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So they talked to you about an apple. Well, later on when you grew up and you took more courses on your Catholic faith or in whatever faith you came from, uh, then they explain things a little deeper and then you began to understand better what is meant by the fall. Genesis is the first book of the scriptures. And in it, there is the description of how we humans came to be. Now, the problem is that a lot of people look at the book of Genesis or they look at the entire Bible to find scientific truth when in fact they should be looking for religious truth. To go to the Bible to try to find scientific truth is like me going to the shoemaker uh, because I have a toothache. I, I'm in the wrong place because that's not where I should be going. I should be going to a dentist. So you want to look for religious truth. Now it does not mean that it, there are no scientific facts that you can find in religious truth, but primarily on the scriptures you want to look for religious truth. Hebrew. Hebrew is simply the other term that we use for Jewish people. Instead of saying a Jew, we say a Hebrew person. The only thing that I want to clarify, and, and I want to make it very clear for you, is the idea that a if you are Jewish, if you are Hebrew, either in this world you are a Hebrew or you are a Gentile. That means you are, if you are a Gentile, you're not Jewish. And do remember that a Jew is anybody who is born of a Jewish mother. If you were not born of a Jewish mother, then you're a Jew by conversion, but not because the Jewish community acknowledges you as a Jew because you were not born of a Jewish mother. You need to have been born of a Jewish mother. It doesn't make any difference to the Jewish community whether that woman was practicing or not practicing the Jewish faith. As instantly, when you are born of that woman, you are considered a Jew. Highly unusual in a very patriarchal or father-oriented religion. 
um, the term idolatry. We tend to believe that idolatry is just adoring a particular statue and we think that is idolatry but when we think about the concept of idolatry we have to go deeper to understand that idolatry is also it could be money it could be sex it could be power those are forms of idolatry too okay idolatry is worshiping that which is not god imago dei is latin for the image of god we believe that we were created in god's image and likeliness and what does that mean it means that we have a personal dignity you know when we talk about human rights human rights depend precisely on that idea that we were made in the image and likeliness of god so that's what we we talk about the imago dei is that we were made in the image of god Israel the judges uh, the judges were the people who came after Moses and when Moses was no longer the leader of the Hebrew people the judges became the leaders of the Hebrew people it meant that they were the elders of the Hebrew people do not be um do I, I don't want you to get confused by the term judges because by judges you just mean people who led the Hebrew people after Moses. We don't mean people who study law and they made judgments like we judges made today in a court of law. That's not what is meant by, uh, by judges. And of course Israel is the land of milk and honey. It is the, the land promised to them which is today called Palestine too. Levites, Levites is that particular uh, tribe of Israel from which one of the 12 tribes of Israel and the Levites are the the priestly caste and remember that we would have priests in the Jewish faith up until the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem and after that we begin to get the synagogues and the synagogue the change from the temple to the synagogue immediately tells us that we went from being a priestly people a people who offered sacrifices to a people who became a people who learn who are into the intellectual pursuit of the faith because a synagogue means that a place of learning then we have manna um, oh no we have the book of Leviticus and again in the, the book of Leviticus you find a great deal of what it is that the priestly caste of Israel used to do. And then you have manna, and manna means literally food from heaven. It is what was given to the Israelites so when they crossed the desert after they left the slavery they were under in Egypt, they had no food and God would provide food for them and that is called manna and it literally came from heaven and they were able to have manna in order to survive marriage is the idea that marriage as a concept has always been here and that marriage is between a man and a woman and that marriage has uh, the whole idea of love because without love there is no marriage and also the whole idea of procreation that marriage is fruitful because the scriptures say be fruitful and multiply and it says uh, he created man and woman and they became one flesh and they were to be fruitful and they were to multiply and that's the whole idea of marriage the Messiah is Christ is the Messiah that that all, everything as far as we are concerned was fulfilled in Jesus Christ and we believe him to be the Messiah the Jewish people do not believe that Christ is the Messiah because they believe that no human being that can become God uh, that, that it, it is impossible for them to understand it, it is to belittle God in their idea and their perspective to think that a human being can be God therefore this idea that Christ is God is not something they can swallow okay but that's what it's coming from 
It is not a rejection of Christ as the Messiah because they feel like it. It is a rejection because if it wasn't Christ, they would have rejected any other human being simply because they do not believe that a human being can be truly man and truly God as we claim Jesus is. Moral law. The moral law, there is a moral law and the church very much talks about a moral law as an objective truth, not as subjective at all. It talks about a moral law. So when, just to give you an example, it says that abortion is an, an abominable sin. It claims that it is a grievous sin. Uh, where is that coming from? That is coming from what we call the moral law. Moral law is not to be confused with civil law because civil law may resemble moral law, but it is definitely not moral law. Moriah is a mountain. And at this point, that's all I'm going to tell you, that it is a mountain. Uh, just know that it is Moriah and that it is a mountain and it is very close to Jerusalem. And Mount Sinai is where the Jewish people, uh, not the Jewish people, that Moses would receive the Ten Commandments. Okay, do remember that the Ten Commandments we call the Decalogue or the Decalogue and Deca meaning ten. Okay, but there are many, many, many commandments that you will find in the Hebrew Scriptures, but it's just that those Ten Commandments are a summary of all those commandments. Then you have Mount Zion, which is also very close to Jerusalem, and I will be talking more specifically about that to you in class. Uh, especially the word Zion, because after World War II, uh, many Hebrew people, because they went through the Holocaust and the pain of the Holocaust, they wanted to go to Zion. And they used to be called Zionists. There was a reason for them being called Zionists, because they wanted to go back to that place that they felt was their home. And in that home, they would find that mountain called Mount Zion. And it's very, very close to Jerusalem. I'll be speaking more about that. But just be aware that, th that it does exist even to our own day. And then we say, finally, that the church is the mystical body of Christ. We tend to think of the church as an institution only. An institution only that has a structure, a particular structure. We think of the church as having a deacons and priests and bishops and the Pope. We think of a college of cardinals who elects the Pope. Uh, we think of Catholic universities, we think of Catholic hospitals, we think of Catholic high schools, we think of uh, Catholic hospices, etc., etc. And all this humongous structure of one billion Roman Catholics form this institution, indeed the church is an institution called the Roman Catholic Church. True, but we also believe that the church is the mystical body of Christ, which means that it is Christ in space and time. Christ uh, went up to heaven, but he left his church, and he is part of this church, and he continues to teach us, and he continues to guide us, and he continues to sanctify us, to make us holy as we go along in the journey of life. So dear students, please study these terms uh, because they're going to be very important. There will be another video in which I will finish all of these terms and then you will be prepared to really, really understand chapter 2 and understand that without understanding this terminology, it's going to be very hard for you to understand what is it that we're dealing about because we get a little deep in here as far as understanding what the church is. Thank you.